there any introduction? No? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Klaus Majewski. I work for Stonesoft. And I'm talking you a little bit something that Mikko mentioned, that when you have governments and military breaking in, uh, I'm actually showing you some of the techniques they might use. Of course, we don't know. But it, it is a backdoor technique that actually goes through all the network security devices. So basically, if you're doing hacking and you're worried about bypassing firewalls and IPS systems, you can do it with this. And then you have to do your own exploits to actually exploit the devices. So I, I start with the small presentation about what we think happened, and then um, I will show you a real-life demo with real devices and show how it actually works, and then you can ask questions. So let's see how it worked. Uh, we start from far away. A uh, little bit about the security. So you know that there is the reality where the hackers are, and we are defending there. And then you have the feeling, so the customers or, or you as yourself, do you feel secure? Are your protection okay? And then there's the third part of it. It's a model, how we actually protect against those bad guys. And if you take a look at it, it actually only works this way. I think it comes from Bruce Nyer or somebody else. It's a triangle that reality changes, and after that, the feeling changes, and the model how we protect against them changes. But if, if my feeling changes that I feel less secure right now, it doesn't change the reality. Or if I use some new technology, it doesn't change the reality. The reality changes first, and then we react. And we have been doing research about advanced evasion techniques starting 2007. And we can show you that something has changed because hackers are much better now. They either use government sponsors or they use the criminals to get really bright minds there. And why reality has changed? Mikko showed some great examples. Why? Because hacktivism has increased, Anonymous and those guys. Nationalization of cybercrime, really good examples. So governments doing hacking for their own purposes. Industrialization of hacking, meaning that those guys, they want to earn money. So they have enough money to pay guys like you, very bright guys, who think new ways to hack in and protect against them. I think we are supposed to be white hats here. So basically protecting against black hats. Um, and I'm showing you one piece of technology that actually can do that. I was talking with some guys from UK from, for their government agencies, and they said that the APT, the Advanced Persistent Threat, actually came from them, because when they were internally talking about threats, they were talking about China, but they cannot say that publicly. So they were using APT in the public, and then it leaked out, and now it looks like Advanced Persistent Threat means a group of people that are really dedicated to attack your system. And they will use any time, any resources needed to break in. And we think that advanced evasion techniques is one technique that they can use to do that. And of course, we all know that there's uh, information and money is digital nowadays. So you can really do business there. And also, we, we all have cell phones, they get better, and tablets. So there, there's more processing power there. And also, if you think from the cyber criminal's point of view, if I attack, let's say, 100 million targets, but I only get $100 from each of them, that's a huge amount of money. But for each individual, as you, it's only $100. And if you go to the police department and say, I was hacked, I, I lost $100, they don't really care. And even worse, even if you take it to the court and say that I lost $100, I want to prosecute those guys who actually did it, there is no good international law that allows you to do that if the hackers came from Romania or Russia or some other country where the 
laws are a little bit different than maybe in, in Europe. So it's a very lucrative place for the cyber criminals to go. First, easy to make money. You won't get catched. Even if you get catched, you won't be prosecuted. So why to do criminal things in the physical world? This, this is from the last year. So you notice that the hackers are not doing very simple hacks anymore. Basically, they do in a two-phase. If you remember the RSA uh, hack, so they got the, all the knowledge of the security keys. They used that information to go into the Lockheed Martin, another defense contractor. So it wasn't a simple thing to do. It required a lot of thinking, and they were quite successfully doing that. And uh, Stuxnet and Dooku, I won't go into that, but similar kind of stuff. And a lot of people were asking that, am I a target? We go into the advanced evasion techniques in a while. So is this something that somebody's targeting me? If you are a really small company, no problem. They won't target you. If you are in a high-tech media retail, industrial manufacturing, probably not unless you have really good IP, so uh, intellectual property. But you, if you are in a government, defense, banking, critical infrastructure, running like the electrical grid here in France, yeah, you will probably face some of the advanced evasion techniques sooner or later. And uh, from the commercial point of view, you can say that Security vendors have been doing better every year, so the defense goes higher. But something happened last year because the hackers are much better now. So something was there that they found out, and, and they are able to hack in into a lot of places where you shouldn't be able to hack. And those sitting ducks are either you as a customers or we as a security vendors. We should do something. And now to the technology part. Um, evasion techniques. I was yesterday talking with some guys, and they said, yeah, evasion techniques. We are all evading something. But these evasion techniques works on the network security. So firewalls, next generation firewalls, IDS, IPS, even routers that do deep packet inspection. So this technology evades them. And when I mean evade, it, it is a kind of transport mechanism. We can take any kind of exploit. I, I will use a configure as an example because it's about a couple of years old. Everybody is able to detect it and block it. But once we wrap it inside evasion techniques, it looks like a normal traffic. So the network security devices are kind of fooled. They look, they, they don't see the configure, for example, anymore. And when we started to research this in 2007, we started to test our own products, firewalls and IPSs and stuff like that. But there were no testing tools. So our R&D guys went out there and tried to look, is there anything about evasions? And 1998, there was a, a, a university paper about evasions. So people knew about them already then. But there was no implementation. Some Metasploit had something. Uh, there are some commercial, like Breaking Point, they have some evasions built in, but really basic stuff. So they decided, let's build our own testing tool. And they did that, and they found three things. They found that every protocol has their own evasions. You can actually put two evasions together. So if you have protection against A and B, and if you put them together, it becomes a new evasion. And on top of that, if you put them in a different order, like B and A, it's a yet another evasion, and we'll bypass the stuff. And so what they found out was that they found around, I, I think currently it's about 400 different kind of basic evasions. We call them atomic evasions. But you can combine them all with these different kind of permutations, if you will. So the total number of different kind of combinations is so big number that I don't know the name for it. It's like an antivirus maybe 15 years ago. Like Mikko said, when they started to first look at the antivirus, 
We think that with advanced evasion techniques, it's the same thing. We are like 15 years ago in antivirus. Nobody knew how many viruses there will be. And I think, I think they said that they, they stopped counting a couple of years ago because there were so many. So these advanced evasion techniques, it's a similar kind of breakthrough. Okay, uh, when we found out that there were so many, so we built this testing environment. We started testing our own products. We could bypass them. Then we thought that, is this our, our problem only? So we got all the other products also in the testing rack. And we ran the advanced evasion techniques through them. It took two seconds to bypass any of them. They didn't see anything after that. So the network security was busted after that. And that was 2010. So we got worried. And we contacted CERT in Finland. That's where we come from. And we gave them 23 examples so that they can distribute it to all the other security vendors. And the response was funny. All the vendors said, doesn't concern us, no problem. And still, when we test them in our lab, it actually goes through. So what is going on? Uh, by to date, we have sent more than 410 examples. Still, most of the security vendors are denying the whole thing. Some of them are acting now a little bit more um, or starting to research about these things. Uh, this is a high-level view of evasions. So if you are a C-level guy, this is for you. The technical instructions comes a little bit later. So if you take a look at this man, he looks like a guy you can trust, but actually he's using evasions. Because if you remove the evasions, you can see the total picture. And that's actually what happens in the network security uh, when you use evasions. So you can hide uh, any kind of exploit inside them. This is more technical for the technical people. So if you take a look at the TCP IP stack, um, there are evasions for each layer of the TCP IP stack. And if you want to get rid of evasions, there is a way to do that. It's called traffic normalization. Basically, you go, have to go through the TCP IP stack, each layer, do the normalization of traffic, so removing evasions, and then take a look at the packet payload and try to see if there's malware. But you have to do that on all layers for all the protocols, because if you skip layer or two, you will miss them. And for the normal network security devices, they have this kind of visibility to the traffic. They can see a couple of packets. But if you, you take the hacker point of view, you can play with these limitations. We did the one test in uh, 2009. We basically took the configure and uh, fragmented it in two segments, or fragments. And then we sent the first fragment, and it went through the network security device. Then we waited 10 seconds and sent the second part. And it actually went true. But if we sent them together, the network security device would actually detect and stop it. Do you know why? Probably a couple of you can guess. Because those network security devices are built for speed. If you have to handle 10 million connections per second, you can only allocate this much memory for one connection. And that memory amount was about seven seconds at that time. So when we sent the first packet, it, it was aware that it was a configure, and it was waiting for the second packet before it had the whole configure or the signature match. But around seven seconds, that memory space was refreshed, so it lost the awareness of that configure. And when the second part of the configure hit the device, it saw only half of configure but wouldn't stop it because it wasn't complete. That's a really simple example of evasion. And it worked. 2009, we could bypass a lot of the security vendors just by doing that. This is the way it should be done. So you can actually take a stream, take a look at the whole stream, how the data is going through the network security device. And on each layer of the TCP IP stack, you remove the evasions. Take a look at the payload, repeat the same thing on the next layer, and then you take a look at the whole stream. 
And if you find malware there, you stop it. If you don't, just let it go. This has two limitations because it requires more memory. All the 32-bit environments are kind of rubbish because they stop at the 4 gig with memory. If you do hardware acceleration, you have to do some low-level packet handling changes. And if you do that, you cannot do that actually in the hardware, or it would require some kind of BIOS update or similar kind of activity. So we think that the network security devices should be so dynamic that you can actually update and, and modify even the low-level packet handling as we continue to research and find new different kind of evasions. And why is this worrisome? Like in Mikko's presentation, you saw the, the, the Stuxnet and those centrifuges. Uh, the country where I come from, Finland, we have lots of paper factories, and we run them with industrial control systems. You know that there's a big paper machine. Normally, when it stops, it costs about 1 million euros per hour. And do you know what kind of computers they are using to control those? They are still Windows NTs. Because the lifespan of the industrial system is about 15 years. So once they build it, they don't change it for 15 years. And you know that Microsoft don't provide any more patches for NT. So as a security professional, how do you protect against that? Of course, you add additional layers of security, like firewalls or IPSCs, because they can block those attacks before they hit the vulnerable host. And now you can see that with these evasions, you can bypass that additional layer of security. So you can basically go to any, let's say, electrical grid, nuclear power plants, if they are connected to network. There was an article about a week ago when there, there was one guy who, who did a search in the internet how many industrial control systems were connected directly to internet. It was more than 10,000. So they are not separated anymore from the internet. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of other guys who are talking about this. ICSA labs and NSS labs, they do research, or they actually do testing for the security devices. They have tested evasion techniques and say it works. Gardner, they don't do any testing, they do more commercial stuff. Uh, there's also a UK uh, university. It's actually university when the UK government, when they get breached, they sent the network forensics team there, and these guys are actually those who make the cleanup. And uh, they said that they have seen these advanced evasions in use. The other place where we have seen them used are in, in our own honeypots, what, what they are out there in the internet. And other security vendors, they, they are quiet about this. So that's why I'm talking here as for the security community, that you as a professionals and, and users would pressurize all the security vendors to take actions on this so that they would start some research on this area and maybe get some other protection. We can provide some protection, but it would be nice to have some other parties to research this area and actually find some other ways to protect against this. Some stuff on the news and off the record. Some of the other companies have been contacting us and said, can you share us more examples? The problem is that you cannot fix this issue just providing fingerprints or signatures. Because I can find easily a million different evasions that work for your device. If you write the fingerprint for each of them, you know that the normal network security device handles from 3,000 to 10,000 different kind of signatures, and that's the maximum currently. If you would put one million fingerprints there, it would die. All the performance would be one meg, something like that. So there has to be another way, and we think that this traffic normalization is the thing to do. Okay, we have been doing this testing, and we think we have the best protection against that because we have the testing tool and we know about it, but we also think that there must be governments that know about this technology. There must be cyber criminals that know about this technology because they are not stupid. They can find clever people. 
So we think that everybody should at least be aware of this. And if you go Black Hat in Las Vegas, uh, July, take a look. We, we are providing some stuff out there. So um, take a look at that. But you don't have to believe me just like this. I'll actually show it how it works. Let's take a connection to the lab. Uh -huh. Do we have a network connectivity issue? Hope not. Mm -hmm. Let's do it the other way. Let's use the IP address. It's No, no connection, sorry. <laughs> it doesn't work from outside, but okay, you can try. Yeah, I know I'm on the screen. If you if you like I can do it this way too. Okay. Okay, so we are in the lab environment, safe place. Let's put it that way. This is a real life environment. So we have, uh, what we have here is, uh, it's a Wikipedia, so you can actually See, it's this kind of environment. Sorry if it's a little bit small. There you can see um, we have the, the hacker machine or attacker is down there. Then there's uh, actually different pair of cables uh, through different kind of firewalls or IPS devices. So whenever you choose a different product, you actually go through different set of cables. And then it goes through that network security device and hits uh, Windows XP Service Pack 2 because that's vulnerable for the configure. So we need a vulnerable host at the other end. We don't even try to fix it because we are not doing penetration testing. We are actually trying to bypass the firewalls and IPSs with advanced evasion techniques. So that's the environment. It's a live environment, so all the devices are real. And if I take a look at the testing tool, the testing tool looks like this. It actually has uh, two exploits. We implemented only two exploits because it's a kind of proof of concept or testing tool. It doesn't really actually matter what kind of exploit you are using. It could be a zero day or it could be an old one. We are using the old ones 
like the configure, because we know that everybody are able to detect them and stop them. So we are using the configure here first. There's also HTTP exploit, because some of the people said that, well, the Windows stuff is only for internal networks. Can you use something, some exploit that would work from internet? So this PHP exploit is for, to demonstrate that it can be done that way too. Then there's a list of products you can actually try to bypass. And uh, I'll probably take a Cisco as an example because everybody has them. And then the target machine. It, uh, for the configure, it's a Windows XP. For the PHP exploit, it's Ubuntu running Apache and PHP on top of that. So exploitable machines. And then here we have different kind of evasions. So IP la layer, TCP layer, a little bit more of them, net bias, SMB, uh, open up, yeah. here, MSRPC. And why did we choose these Microsoft protocols? Because they are still on uh, top of the any search list if you take a look at the statistics, automatic reports and stuff. So they are the mostly used uh, exploits. Configure is still running free there. And um, let's make this small. So how we normally test this is that we, we are running first the configure without any evasions so that we can actually see that the product is stopping them. Um, okay, we need the device also. So like I said, it's a real environment. We have to log in. Their logs are somewhere here. So let's take a look. So there's the log screen. And then we go back. No. And then go back there. So we run the predator. So first when we run it, it, it actually the GUI is just a snappy GUI for the command line. It actually runs the command line. And then you can see here, no shell attack failed. So it means that somebody's blocking configure like it should. So let's do the refresh from the logs. So you can actually see Windows Server Service Remote Execute. So that's the configure when it actually tries to exploit the Windows XP. And remember the timestamp now. Uh, let's see the UTC. Uh, if I can do it. So 846, whatever. And now, if we start using evasions, I take this an, as an example, MSRPC Big Endian. Basically what we do here, that you remember that uh, difference between Little Endian and Big Endian, you read the bytes from left to right or right to left. So Microsoft actually implemented both ways. They were clever that way, but all the network security devices, most of them are using Little Endian byte encoding because 95% of the companies are using that. But if we change that to Big Endian, I think some IBM AIX systems still use Big Endian Python encoding at some point of time. So we just do that kind of change, and then we run the same configure that was detected earlier, and now we got the shell. And if you actually go in the Cisco logs and do the refresh, there's nothing. As a system admin, how do you know that we were hit by the configure? There's no way. That's why we were worried. And it, uh, I don't want to blame Cisco. They are doing a fine job. It doesn't matter what's, whichever vendor I take. We can bypass them all. And we normally run this environment about one million evasions per day against our own products. But for the competitors, every Friday, we update all their products and latest updates, and we run about two minutes just to find two evasions that actually work.
We just want to see, are they actually developing any remedies against that? Currently, we don't see much uh, better, better behavior there. And just to give you a little bit about this, this is automated testing tool. So the, uh, the configure, when it goes through, it, it opens a port, a high port, and then if, if the high port is open, the attacker actually connects to that one and opens this shell. And we had it that way because if you run automated environment and you run millions of these evasions, because we don't know which ones actually work, we have to try it out. And once we get the shell, we know that this one worked. It automatically, I, I, I think it shows it here, it automatically does the traffic capture. So we know what happened and we send it to our R&D and they will do the traffic normalization and push the dynamic update to all, all the products. So it is manageable, but we would like to see some other companies also to research this area because the attack space is so huge that if you have to actually try each and every evasion and their combinations, it will take several years to comb through that whole space. And I was talking with R&D guys and they said that currently they can combine up to 35 to 40 evasions together and so that the traffic is still manageable. Um, there was a T2 conference in Finland last year and one of the hackers, they looked at the traffic dump and said that, oh, it looks ugly. The traffic looks ugly when you're using evasions. But he said that maybe you can measure the ugliness of the traffic to see how many evasions are used there. Because at the end, if you're using too many evasions, uh, even the target system doesn't understand it anymore and then it's useless because the exploits won't work anymore. So, um, um, I can also show how, how it actually works if you, if you do the traffic normalization correctly. Not that one. And uh, while this putting up, uh, there is nothing wrong with evasions. So evasions like fragmentation, if you play with the fragmentations or different kind of flags, it's normal traffic in a, um, in a network. So you cannot really stop all the evasions because if you just stop all the evasions, you, you are also stopping normal traffic. So that's why the, the testing tool actually, if you take a look, it has a false positive testing too. Because I have been dealing with some vendors and they, if they shut down their whole IPS or firewall so that no traffic goes, of course, even the exploits won't work. So there's a, this tag. You can actually send clean payload. We are using uh, Windows XP when, when it does the file, um, uh, um, sharing files, it's using actually the same commands that we are using. And then, so we can send those as a clean traffic and it should go through because it's legitimate traffic. If, if it goes through, then we add the configure there and then the network security device should be able to stop it. And if it stops it, then we start playing with evasions. So it's a great testing tool in that way. We also saw that some, some people they were doing uh, something called banner crapping. So when, when the exploit actually went through and opened the high port and, and then the attacker connects to the shell, the shell actually says Windows XP service back too. So it, they do banner crapping and, and cut the connection. And some vendors say that, so we took care of all your evasions. And my point is no. We, we have also implementation of this using the RDP exploit. So it actually blue screens the other machine. So it doesn't have to take a shell back. It just depends on the, on the exploit what you are using. So let's do the same thing what we had here. Uh, try to get the windows visible. Sorry, there. Yeah, okay, I put the logs on. Because this is how it should look when you actually do the traffic normalization correctly. Let's see, it takes a while. 
No, while it's thinking about it, let's go to to Predator again. So we do the same thing what we did for the Cisco. So first, let's just don't get there. So take away the clean payload, take away the evasions. So we first send the just a configure to see if it is stopped. So we're running. So no cell attack failed. And if we take a look at the, here you can see the, the red entry. It actually says the configure, the exploit it's actually using. Live environments are a little bit slow. So it was able to stop it. And then if we take the same thing with the evasion, so clear logs, and we are using this big endian and run it. No shell. And if you take a look at the logs, you can actually see it sees that the big endian byte order was used. So you can see that there was some evasion, but necessarily that's not the problem. But when it actually sees the Windows Server Service buffer overflow, that means configure was there and the connection has to be dropped. And in order to make this more effective, we can, of course, run it in a patch mode. So depending what kind of device you have, I, I have a small device here, two workers, how long, and it randomly tries different kind of evasions and runs them until one of them goes through, or you can let it run for a couple of days and see all the things that actually went through. So it's a very powerful thing. So it starts running and then it runs now for one minute. And every time, it, uh, and if, if we take a look at the firewall locks, you can see there's a lot of stuff, different kind of stuff what it tries. Okay, <clears throat> that was pretty much my demo. Any questions? So, like, if I, I saw yesterday when I was talking with some other speakers, there are a lot of guys here that are doing exploits. This is not an exploit. This is a transport mechanism for an exploit so that the exploit can penetrate all the network security defenses. And we think in a cyber war warfare, they are using this kind of methods. So if you think you are safe, think again. Yes? What's your recommendation on the importation of these kind of techniques and tools like Metaport? Yeah. Um, the question was that um, can this kind of techniques be implement implemented in uh, um, exploit tools like Metasploit? We actually thought about that, uh, but we are a little bit afraid to do that because there is a possibility to do uh, what we call uh, advanced evasion proxy. So basically the idea, not implemented, idea is that if you have Metasploit or some other exploit generator, you run the traffic through the evasion proxy. So you have thousands of different exploits, millions of different evasions, combine them together there's nothing you cannot break. Uh, we didn't want to do that because it's too good of, you know, weapon or something like this. This is a testing environment. But yeah, idea is there. Any other? No? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>